This is the OGM weekly call, the check-in call on Thursday, April 27th, uh, 2023. We, um, we are gathered here, um, dearly beloved, we are gathered here to celebrate the world in all its strangeness and uh, all the different ways in which we are interacting with it. And uh, and apparently, Doug Carmichael has a birthday today. A little bird is telling me. Um, so, ah. <laughs> Doug, you're 29? Uh, 29, I think, by a fact, multiplied by three. Excellent. No, I'm, I'm 86. I can't believe it. That is crazy and wonderful. Um, happy birthday. A heartfelt heartfelt birthday wishes from us thank you for thank being you here all. um we are in check-in mode and um doug is just back from a trip to montenegro and i just learned moments ago that he's going to move there for a while uh so since we are in check-in mode maybe doug you'd be a great person to sort of uh, take us in to do a bit of uh, a bit of check-in and uh i will step aside and we can do the use your hand to step in for the check-ins. Uh, I won't pass the floor. Uh, take a take a beat or a breath or a pause before you check in so that we have a chance to um, kind of process what everybody's saying. And then when everybody's gone once, so please don't respond to what's being said during the check-in round. Um, when everybody's kind of gone once, then I'll step back in and, and uh, play traffic uh, cop for the conversation and we can go from there. But um, uh, Doug, if you'll if you'll take us in, that would be lovely. Well, I'm somewhat reluctant, but I will. Uh, what's been on my mind, other than moving to Montenegro, which is a, probably the last big adventure of my life, uh, and I'm really looking forward to it, but it's filled with crises, which is why I'm going there. Uh, so my check-in, what I've been thinking about is, is this group another example of climate denial. Uh, and if we weren't doing climate denial, what would we talk about? Uh, questions like, what do we do with the remaining time? And how much remaining time do we have? So I'm going to stop there. And Gil, I can't tell if you're pausing just to pause, but uh, the pause is welcome. Uh, you have your hand up and the floor is yours. I am pausing just to pause. Thank you. And the, the cue to us that you that you got that is you unmute yourself, but don't start speaking yet. But that's totally fine there. I just couldn't see you because your video is not on. Got it. Thank you. I'll do that. So, um, yeah, thank you, Doug, for that gentle lead in. Um, I'm thinking a lot these days about climate denial and uh, poisoning of the planet denial and fascism denial. Cheery little morning themes. Um, but I'm, um, I'm not liking the trends I'm seeing um, or the reactions that we're mounting to them. Um, um, and so this is a interest for me an interesting background of deep concern against my usual uh, you know glasses half full perspective on things. Um, um, the personal background on this is that COVID has finally visited our household. Jane and I have had both had very mild cases, uh, so that's good. Um, but what has struck me about it is not not so much the physical symptoms but the mental. Um, you know, um, energy flagged, focus down, um, and, um, um, you know, much more reactive to things than driving forward with, with, with focus and, um, 
you know, and uh, and so in the midst of it, I wonder, is that just like, you know, is that a passing phenomenon that will fade with this, this disease, or is that a, a new phase for me um, in my life? And uh, um, so again, there's another, there's another glass is not half full perspective on, uh, on a complex situation. Um, um, and I'll just say one more thing um, on the, the poisoning of, Something Jane and I have been talking about a lot, and from you know, from ecological perspective and medical perspective, it seems that we are in a very, very bad game. Um, you know, kicking kicking the supports out from under everything that matters, um, with little recognition of that, and um, um, you know, and it's a mystery about how that gets shifted if it does get shifted. Um, so. Um, that's where I am. I will. Um, the, the focus will return. Uh, the um, you know my my fighting spirit will return. But looking for I'm 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 puzzling about where to stand in the midst of this phase in human history, um, and how to contribute, uh, and how to do it in a way that keeps uh, body and soul in this household together. Um, and on that cheery note, I will pass the. Silent stick. Yeah, what comes to mind um, is a French guy. Um, I don't know if he's still alive, but some 10 years back, he was a survivor of. Uh, the Nazi occupation in France and uh, you know, experienced this entire horrible Second World War um, era <clears throat> with all its implications and so on and listening to this horrible stuff. And he was writing a little book uh, saying, time to be outraged. Mm. And, um, and it really captured me because that's was just about the time that I started to get into sustainability issues. I had taken the course with Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia and, and you know, MIT and stuff. And I was thinking, which is crazy. I mean, what is this here, right? And the idea that, you know, you have to be outraged in order to express the emotion that is needed to communicate what you need to say, right? This is this whole idea of politeness, and you can see it now. You know, I was listening yesterday to this young trans lady in Montana, who is just so incredibly articulate and so touching in the way that she uh, reached out. You now, when there is a there is a recording uh, by the the Young Turks uh, that. Uh, showed her speech on the floor of the Montana legislator. Um, it just it just blows you away. And then they kicked her out. You know, and and so the the this this madness that that is uh that is gripping us, you know, in people deeply understand and know that something is like really off, right? I mean Florida California is underwater, the Mississippi with a Delta is flooding. I mean, there's around the world, you know, there is so much stuff happening. And so you 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 feel it, you know, physically feel it. My wife can't even uh, talk about it anymore because she's just so anxious now. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, I went to a meeting yesterday in Bend on with a clean tech, you know, the organization of uh, people who are working in the um, um, in the space of um, uh, building, you know, clean energy systems, uh, solar systems, and all of this, no one from food and agriculture present. You know? um, and so I'm you know, continuing trying to explain that one third of global emissions are caused by the way we grow and raise our food and consume food. You know? And you can't get yeah. enough energy into this field to understand that this is really true. <laughs> this is really happening, right? And guess what? 
Uh, they, they, they are food shortages building up uh, around the world, and it's going to hit us. It's going to hit us unprepared and really hard because we can't talk about it. And there comes a point where you don't want to cause offense. It's like the, what happened to you know, those two black uh, legislators in, in uh, representatives in Tennessee and this trans girl in, in Montana. You speak up and they kick you out. Yeah? But so, so you, you, there has to be a point of, of expressing yourself with an intensity right, that rings through. And I think this group here, as professional people who are articulate you know, and who have uh, the ability to express complex thoughts in ways that hits through, you know, we have an obligation to speak up. You know, and I think this is what Doc is referring to and what I totally emphasize. You know? So we need to have conversations you know, that deal with the amazing uh, challenge that our generation is facing here. You know? and, and literally, I mean, I took my very first course, University of Illinois, Introduction to Sustainability. I wrote a paper, um, Are We Insane? Right? And and the professor organized a roundtable after because that's one 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 of I think that was the first class you see Illinois organized on on Coursera, um, and he goes yeah I mean there's nothing you can do you know you can just talk about it and explain it, and it's just like my God how can you run towards a wall knowing you're going to clash into it, you know and just keep running yeah. You know? I mean, there has to be a point where you go, whoa, you know, maybe we need to slow this thing down and then maybe shift course so we avoid this wall. And maybe we can swing by it, you know? And yeah, so I mean, I, I just, I'm just so distressed you now. It's, uh, um, and, and, you know, I'm trying to be calm and rational and find uh, ways around the, the barriers, you know, that, uh, that's, that prevent people from listening. You know? Even with the tech guys yesterday, you know, water specialist. Well, do you realize that here in the high desert, 86% of the water is used by agriculture? So all the you know, energy you have is focused on 14% of the problem. If you solve, so, say, solve half of it, you, know, you have achieved a 7% reduction. It's not going to cut it. So, so it's, it's, yeah, it's... Uh, it's not a good time. I'll go. Um, I like the notion, think globally, act locally. I've been thinking about that a lot. And I've been dealing with, um, I think it's called an adjustment disorder, where as basically, as far as I can understand it, my parents were immigrants or born in America of, of immigrant parents. And they were raised to be gems. And they were. And they raised me to be a diamond. And maybe I shone for a while, but it was too much pressure. And, mm, you know, in my 60s, you know, turning 60, I broke, um, expecting myself to be perfect. Now, I think that happens with a lot of immigrant families. So I've had to slow down rather than speed up. And I've developed a mantra, center, check inputs, check outputs, consider before making an emotional expression as I have here in the past, because emotional expressions, especially strong ones have consequences. Emotions are real. 
Feelings are real. They're not just feelings. They are probably close to the bedrock of a reality in some way. There's an ontology of emotion and feeling. So I've been reconsidering the way I'm expressing myself and thinking about whether I should write rather than speak and how to do that. And basically, how I go about doing that, whether I do it for free or whether I try to make some money from it because I've been doing it for free. Um, been experimenting on Facebook and using Facebook as a chat app, using Facebook as uh, a place of curation. Um, I basically invite everybody to check out my public feed on Facebook. And uh, I've been doing some ranting. Um, but lately, I've been doing more, I guess, poetic stuff. Um, I was lucky that a friend gave me a ticket to the um, Arhuli Records Awards and Benefit Ceremony. I saw an amazing blues musician, whose name I forget, Santiago Jimenez <laughs> and Dave Alvin. And I made some recordings on the phone. Um, this uh, amazing... Um, it's called Samsung uh, S23 Ultra, and it's just astounding what kinds of um, uh, recordings it can make. Um, so I'm finding out that I'm positive, not in terms of AIDS, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, I wonder about, you know, with the throat, um, you know, and I'm going to get checked out for um esophageal cancer but you know if it comes up i'll deal with it so i'm trying to balance the positivity and negativity um and expressing myself with a certain intensity that is more calm more clear and more inviting for people to actually listen rather than go oh man mark's too loud um which i have been and finding that I've been my own worst enemy, that I've internalized a lot of repression. A lot of that has come from my parents internalizing a lot of repression. My mother always used to say, her mother said, never ask for help because then people will have an advantage over you and they will manipulate you. And that's a terrible lesson. Absolutely terrible. Because... We all need each other. United we stand, divided we fall. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm in some physical pain. So if you notice anything in my demeanor, it's just just pain in my back. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as I was listening to Doug and Gil speak, especially when Gil was talking about feeling that the supports were not there. What's really on my mind, my concern is that as things get worse, there's going to be a lot of people experiencing emotional distress and that we're not equipped to handle things now, but we are really going to be in bad shape as time goes on. And I keep thinking about the guns that are out there. And I keep thinking about the way we're unable to speak with each other. And um, I, I accidentally wound up on a call on Sunday, I thought I was going to part two of a workshop and I wound up on a call, it was called spiritual inclusion. It was a wonderful call. And the person leading it asked for us to think about the last time we were in a political conversation with somebody that we didn't wanna be in. And I had just had one with a very close friend of mine, the only person that's in my life still that, is totally on the other end of the spectrum. 
And it was really, it really taught me something. And I spend a lot of time thinking about the way I react to people. But I realized that my impatience with her and my wanting to just like, her fear was just so ridiculous in my mind that I was just like, oh, I couldn't, she's so trapped in like the right wing narrative. In this particular case, she had brought up the fact that children are being mutilated. She was, you know, um, that was what was in her mind. But instead of me being able to realize that in her mind, based on what she was hearing, she needed to help these poor innocent children. I couldn't hear that because I was too much like, stop, you're, you're, you're destroying our country. M my point is that those of us that maybe are a little bit more emotionally balanced and recognize more where we are, we're gonna have to work extra hard to keep ourselves in check and figure out a better way to listen to people that do not feel like we do, because there's a reason there's a, they're avoiding things. And then there's the bad actors that are making it even harder to get onto the same page. But I, I guess my message is, we need to start finding ways to build in those support systems. And, you know, it starts with relationships and just building those relationships. So thank you. We have a few people who've joined us uh, since I explained the check-in protocol. Um, we're using the Zoom hand to step into the queue, take a pause before you check in. Please check in only once during the check-in round, uh, and then we'll pick up a general conversation. So I'll check in. A lot of things are top of attention these days. Um, some uh, other high level of abstraction, like uh, the Oracy Lab that I've been organizing, six week session with six people about the question: Why are we so stupid? And is there a difference between being stupid, being dumb, being ignorant, and being a fool? But I'll pass on that for a moment. Uh, I'm also very interested in uh, whether this moment in terms of Kairos is with the real right moment for a major shift in personal and social paradigms, societal paradigms, relates to another word from the ancient Greece, Greek, metanoia, whether for some reason Western society is stricken with what uh, Native Americans uh, have called the uh, wetiko, a uh, kind of soul sickness, a mind virus. But uh, I'll try to write about that last, Kairos, Metanoia, and Metiko, for the next uh, bi-weekly uh, plex. So something more practical on my mind at the moment. Uh, in 10 days, I'll be flying to Amman in Jordan to help facilitate an innovation camp uh, about how to enhance collaboration across nine cultures that share an inland sea, the Mediterranean, uh, about innovations in non-conventional water use under a hot Mediterranean sun, 
and what can make those innovations endure, become sustainable practice. We'll have 50 to 60 people from nine national cultures. A number of prototypes were developed last winter in Tunis, but they remain uh, paper prototypes. And uh, I've taken upon myself the challenge of helping support 50 to 60 people from nine national cultures with no real history of good collaboration to take prototypes from paper and decide on concrete steps to realize them in practice. So to me, that links back to the beginning of the conversation as well about uh, uh, climate change and climate denial. Uh, I'll find out of which people in those nine cultures are not looking up or looking away and which people are actually committed to do something about innovation and water use in very hot Mediterranean cultures. So that's on my mind at the moment. That's uh, interesting. Well, I mean, that everybody's kind of in this situation. I've been uh, gone through a lot uh, with my personal situation and where I'll be living and things. That's kind of two extremes, but I'm trying to focus actually more on the positive. Um, and some of the trying to put perspective on things, I think it was the Tofflers with the third wave or whatever, where they talked about, um, I guess the premise is in, the, in a nutshell is that the communications technology has enabled like the next wave of things. So like writing, it's like three or four millennia to transfer from hunter gatherers to, to farmers. And then the printing press helped um, spark the industrial revolution over three centuries and then the in the lifetime of of um you know the in the past hundred years i mean we've probably had four or five apocal shifts in the technology and things but um I mean, what gives me hope is that we have groups like this so we can be meeting on zoom and anyone in the world can be talking with anybody else in the world in real time. And English has kind of become, I guess, the official first or second language of just about everybody. So, um, so that people can communicate um, complex ideas and things. Um, with all the groups I've been part of, the one thing that is encouraging is there's just, there's, there is a lot of synergy going on and, um, I've since I took a sabbatical from my doctoral program, I've been getting quite involved in the International Society for the System Sciences. And there's some really uh, amazing things that going on. We're going back and really trying to um, build, we're looking to build a systems literacy curriculum uh, and things. So, and then, ha I mean, the, the society is amazing. I mean, almost all the people are, almost all the members are professor emeriti. They got their PhDs with people. I mean, it goes back to like the Macy conferences and things. So it's just an amazing group. And how can, how can, so my, one of my uh, main things is how can we get Gen Z engaging with the con, you know, with that, with the, um, with that, content and and things um 
And um, so, yeah, I'll try to inject some hope into things and, and, uh, and hopefully my home situation will be settled in the next couple of weeks here. Well, I just thought I'd drop in and mention a project I'm starting. Um, it's well, it's a continuation of other projects, uh, so it may sound familiar. Um, I'm doing a video series on contentious issues and exploring the evidence on both sides of it, and then having a kind of competition to have people um, bring up a kind of missed evidence in that first analysis and giving them, you know, small prizes of $100 gift cards for the best pro and con evidence. And then uh, as a community kind of drawing a conclusion mathematically based on those, that evidence um, and exploring and see how it goes like that. The first topic is going to be, is my diet killing me um, about uh, whether the keto way of eating increases your chance of heart disease since I'm keto, did something I was interested in. Um, so yeah, if anyone, if that tickles anyone's fancy, then get in touch, um, either, you know, future topics or that specific topic. Um, well, yeah, so in the project right now, it's uh, evidence explorers. Uh, and we'll do a video. Um, so that's the that's the kind of the project idea. So reach out if if you wanna if that sounds interesting. Can anyone change your mind other than you? And if that is true, would it make any sense whatsoever for me to try? If it's true that people always, always, always do exactly what makes the most amount of sense to them in the context of the moment based on their current understanding, then isn't the best that I can possibly do to provoke thought? Though trying to figure out how to do that without making people defensive, because as soon as someone becomes defensive, then we're arguing. As Covey said in The Seven Habits, seek first to understand, then to be understood. So if, if you do something that makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever, is it because of something you don't understand or because of something I don't understand? I think that were I you, in the context you're in, I would be doing the same thing you're doing. So I look for ways to ask better questions. And I will keep doing that. I like how things are sort of being meshed and crossed over in the chat. Um, it's lovely. Uh, so Monday I had a, a outpatient procedure where I was put under general anesthesia. And in my life history, uh, in 1983, my dad went in for elective kidney stone surgery. Not what I had at all, but um, he died that night. And so... Um, so there was a tiny bit of anxiety that I managed to mostly skirt, but every now and then sort of showed up for me. Uh, but I had a, I was feeling sort of a strong sense of my mortality and a bunch of other things. And now I'm just, I'm feeling great. Everything's uh, gone really well. Um, but I'm in a slightly different headspace. And 
and I'm feeling strongly the the pressure and anxiety of the world and the things that are happening. Uh, this morning, I happened to have watched a short clip of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez speaking, I think, on the steps of the House about the Republican bill that was just passed to basically present a budget alternative for the debt ceiling, which is full of like wiping out help for a, a whole lot of people. And she was angry. She was, <clears throat> but righteously angry in a lovely way. And I don't know if that kind of anger is right, but I have a thought in my brain that says Democrats aren't getting pissed enough. And Republicans are really good at the theater of outrage and at outrage politics. They're really, really good at it. That is their primary tool going into 2027. And there's another piece of me that just wants to stand somewhere on a rooftop and yell, why are we fighting to keep the US from becoming the handmaid's tale when the urgencies that Doug is pointing us toward at the start of this check-in are sitting right there in front of us and a whole series of other things truly could use our collective collaborative friendly attention. And how is it that this that our world is being sort of carted away from in front of us um, as we're sitting here? And I'm and my my quest with us here partly is to figure out how to be open-minded enough to hear other people the way Stacy was just describing, um, and how to be present to see what is possible and what the other side is thinking the way Gene just presented. I mean, like like everything we're talking about here sort of touches um, these attempts to figure out how to make our way through. Because uh, if we can't start collaborating at some higher level, we are driving the bus off the cliff. And, and earlier I put millennialism in a quest with a question mark in the chat because there's some subset of the population that believes that in fact, accelerating the rapture and the uh, end of times is in fact the way to go and and they are very intentionally like making sure the bus goes faster off the cliff and is burning brighter uh, as it as it drives off and that's a little disturbing to me as well um so 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 unfortunately i tend to boil that down to trust and to the battle of ideas and i think this 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 titanic battle of ideas is central to what's happening to us, with us, and around us. And the sphere of idea sharing and acceleration has been super conducted in the last 20 years through social media, through all of the technologies that we are using right now to communicate. And we need to figure out how to make it work in our in humanity's favor instead of against us. Um, and I will end by saying that I am um, I think this is my state for the last 20 years, um, short-term cynic or pessimist and a long-term optimist, meaning I think like it gets ugly. And one of the things that, that AOC says is it's always darkest just before the dawn. This is, these are the last gasps of a dying movement. Those are, I'm nearly quoting her there. Um, and I think she's right. I think that, that basically there's a, a Titanic, reactionary movement that's trying to keep the world from changing and failing but it's doing everything possible everything it knows how to do uh, with incredible force and funding uh, to try to prevent those changes from happening so uh so i'm so i'm strangely even though i think my tone is pessimistic i'm feeling optimistic uh and John, if you want to jump in, if you can raise your hand on your on your on your device, that'll work. Or just step in because I know that you're in, in motion. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, thank you. I'll I'll uh, I'll step in. Am I unblocked? Yeah, you, you can hear hear me, right? I had audio for uh, the, the last uh, four. Uh, sounds like you're having. A, I mean, not that you have trivial conversations. Other times it's a heavy day. Um, so I'm torn between just kind of like, ah, with what the last four or five people were saying and dropping in kind of like a, a semi news bulletin that has some implications for this. And I, I will drop it in because I think it does have some implication. It is in the nature of a, 
of a newsy, you know, a check anything. Uh, I'm there's going to be a thing called D-Web in June. There's going to be a point in the D-Web where they turn off. I mean, I mean, it's a hacker intensive event. You know, there's a whole hacker room. There's high speed fiber, you know, coming in there. But Friday night, they're going to they have a big ceremony and they're going to throw a big theatrical shift switch and they're going to turn off the Internet. And they're going to turn on a mesh net and Holochain, which are proto successors to the internet. And they're not only going to do a technical what comes after the internet, but they're going to do a content what comes after, you know, centralized corporations running things the way they do now. And <laughs> I have the thankless task. I mean, it's, 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 I don't know, it strikes me as funny, but also I'm not at all surprised why they picked me to do this. I'm supposed to come up with the manual backup for when the attempt to do an open exploration through digital sense making, if it breaks, if it fails, I have to have the manual one ready with the, the cards, the pens, and the process, you know, to kind of pull it out. So talk about mixed feelings. You know, I, I said, um, you know, five years from now, we'll look back and we'll say, we're so glad we did. Uh, we, we experimented with digital sense making. I was being honest, but I was also trying to earn the trust of the holo people because I know they're suspicious of people who are deeply analog as I am. Uh, but I meant it. I, I hope it succeeds. And of course, you know, they're talking about things like uh, Tinder like swipes between topics proposed by people who want to have a kind of a conversation and going through lots of Tinder like swipes. And a part of me just went, <laughs> you know, as soon as I heard that, another part of me said, well, John, you know, that's you. Um, you, you got in the spirit of experimentation, you've got to let them do it. You got to see if it works, see what comes out. Have an alternative ready, but see what happens. Um, here we are. We're going into a brave new world. Um, so if any of that is interesting to you all, um, the D-Web is currently has lots of vacancies. Uh, if, if people are interested in going there. And um, also, I mean, I'm, I'm very much aware that I, what I'm talking about on the surface might seem to have nothing to do with the last five uh, presenters, but I think it does in the sense that it's, it's all part of the toolkit. It's part of the toolkit we're trying to build so that what your guy, you guys are all warning about, what I'm warning about sometimes, so that it doesn't happen or so that it happens in a way that is more uh, merciful uh, to those who are uh, gonna be much more uh, victims of what happens. That's my check-in. Thank you, John. I, uh, have, as we've been moving through check-in and conversation, I've been struck by a couple of different um, impressions that I, I don't know that I'll be able to name really clearly, but I'll do my best. Um, I think the first is just noticing that what many of us, the, the lens through which many of us are seeing the current state of affairs and how to show up to the state of affairs is through the, um, what, what sounds to me like a problem solution intervention. Um, and I, and I, get the sense that that might not be how the change we're looking for um, happens. I don't I don't know that I can suggest an alternative. I don't know what an alternative would look like. I think that's what feels that lens, the problem solution lens feels most accessible to me. But I get the sense there's something deeper and there's a different way to show up to the state of affairs that might be more effective, but I don't know what that is. It's just a sense I'm getting. Um, and it feels like it's tied into this other thing, which is that I just keep being struck by this. Con uh, it's a concern that um, 
you know, the problems we are facing are not, um, it's, it's not that, I, I hope it's not that humankind is not evolved enough to show up to the problems that we're facing. Like we just don't, we're just not equipped with the biological hardware to navigate this degree of um, overwhelm and stress and also manipulation that I think a lot of us are being inundated with. And I, I would like to think that I'm wrong. I don't think that's true for everyone, but if, if that is the, if that might be the case for the, for many, um, you know, what are, what does intervention look like? What does support look like? I love what Stacy was saying earlier about this kind of looming sense of like, oh no, oh no, as, you know, as, as she considers the implications of just the, the lack of emotional support already available to those who are privileged enough now to, you know, pay for it and find it. What's that going to look like when things are um, less accessible? What's it going to look like when, you know, whatever this future that is unraveling unravels and that's not, you know, what's, what's, what's that going to look like? And um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I think in all of this, I'm also struck by my own, I'm really checking myself in, you know, if, if we, we've been, I feel like the topic of denial has been inadvertently coming up throughout the conversation. And my, my belief, my lens is that, you know, we denial is, um, you know, I don't think it's always, I don't think it's often conscious. And I think it's something we default to when we don't have adequate emotional inner emotional resource to support holding, um, the difficult or challenging possibility that we're denying. Right. And so I think what it's bringing up for me is like, oh man, where am I still not equipped emotionally, you know, inner, inner resourced enough to equip myself to um, really be with and hold different possibilities in my own life. And, you know, the question of when am I really moving into um, dysregulated fear that might not be productive rather than really being able to hold and consider, okay, like what's, what's realistic for, for me um, in whatever is opening up and um, I don't really know how to say, to say that the way I want to say it. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but I, I think I feel complete with that. Those are just the thoughts I've been having throughout check-in. Thanks. Thank you, Patty. I wanted to talk a little bit about denial too, and and its background. Uh, in the last few minutes is the time uh, that's been coming for a few weeks uh, that roofers are on the roof right above me, um, working on tiles. So I have a. Um, I, I think my noise canceling mic will do an okay job of letting you hear me, but. Uh, I have an impending sense of doom because of people walking on the roof and nails being pulled and things clattering around. So it's a uh, pretty cool, pretty cool experience. The um, so I hear from our, our wise elders uh, Doug and Klaus um, uh, again uh, that we can expect our food system to fail in a couple of years dramatically, um, and. Thinking about that a little bit, as as we do in these calls, um, something that I want now that I realize, um, and I, I'm not sure that I'm not sure who would want this. Uh, David Weinberg and I have had a conversation on the OGM list. We've had a couple conversations on the OGM list where I I'm curious in a, in a way that many people aren't, or or want to analyze systems in in ways people don't, or something. But anyway, um, uh, I realized thinking about the collapse of the food system um, that I'm doing with that topic, the same thing that I've experienced and probably many of us have experienced when I have a health problem, uh, something kind of icky and squishy and, and painful. And you know, so it's like, I could go to the doctor um, but or I could go to the dentist, but I'm really afraid. It's going to be painful when I go to the doctor. 
I'm going to find out something horrible. It's going to be worse than it is now. If I kind of just sit here and, and deal with the pain, maybe I can stretch it out for another couple of weeks and go, I don't like it, but at least I don't know how bad it could be, right? And of course, at some point it gets so bad or more likely, I guess, my, my life partner says, you know, you really need to get that checked out. Just go. And you go and, you know, just in the act of starting to go, it's like, okay, you know, this is a rational thing. It's a human thing. I can get through it. Other people have gotten through it. You hear the good news or the bad news, maybe from the doctor, but then they say, but here's the treatment plan, or here's the thing that we can do, or here's, here's the steps it's going to go through. Or, you know, sometimes it's, it's going to be a long slog for a couple of months, but you'll start to get better. So, um, instead of hearing the food system is going to fail in a couple of years and me going, yeah, well, I'm going to keep having a fun time while, while it lasts. And then I guess I'll deal with that shit later. Um, I would really like to understand, I would, I would like to have kind of an expert analysis of here's what's going to happen as the food system fails, rather than just ignoring it or saying it's going to happen sooner or later, but I don't care. And I think maybe I'm different than some people, so I'm, I'm sure some people won't, wouldn't like this. But, you know, how is that going to happen? Who's going to be affected? Who's going to be affected when? How fast is it going to happen? Um, what are the, you know, what are the signs of the kind of the, the hurricane cloud coming, uh, you know, and, and the weather seems like it's getting better. So we're okay, right? And it's like, no, that's just a sign that things are going to get much more worse soon or, or whatever it is, right? Um, I, I don't know if the OGM community um, and maybe particularly our, our since doing a Marley project uh, is, is a, a locus for that or would be interested in that. But it seems like something that I haven't seen talked about and I would like to know more. And, and then I would like to help others watch for the, the, the signals of, of the impending doom. You know, it's like, okay, so I get that you don't want to deal with your impacted molar or something like that. And here's what's going to happen as it gets worse. And, you know, when it keeps getting worse, here's what you can do to remediate it rather than just continue to ignore it. Um, uh, I, I would like that kind of analysis, kind of, uh, you know, uh, system diagram and explanation of this is probably what's going to happen. And here's, you know, here's the off ramps to making it better and, and how dramatically worse they are as you march down the, the, the path of ignoring it. So I, the, I think this is something uh, we're, we're pretty well into the climate change um, changes and um, it's been interesting and frustrating and, and scary watching the climate scientists continue to get more loud and more vocal. Um, and, and then we're starting to see climate change happen. And, and um, I, one of the reactions for climate change or, or um, uh, food system collapse or, or anything like that, these big existential challenges, um, one of the, the things, especially in the climate change scenario that, that was really difficult for me was listening to people say, we must fix this. Um, because I, I get why a climate scientist or a food systems person would say we must fix this, but it's like, I think we're not going to fix it, or I think we're going to fix it imperfectly, or I think it's going to get fixed in bits and spurts you know, over the course of descent into chaos. Um, so in, for just for me as a reaction to, we must fix this, I would much rather hear, here's what's going to happen. Here are the ways to fix it. Here are the choices we can make and when we expect to be able to, to have to make them or, you know, move to the next set of, the next tranche of choices. The, the we must fix this, expression to me always sounds like a stopping place. And it's like, well, no, we don't have to fix it. Um, rather than a dialogue about how we're going to fix it. So maybe, maybe having had the experience of the climate change, you know, lack of response, 
um, maybe we can do better uh, as, as we can see problems with the food system. Um, and instead of saying we have to fix this, it's like, we don't have to fix it, but it's here's the choices that we're making and or and not making. If we don't make a choice, it's like, you know, choosing that path. And as we continue down these paths, here's the branches and, you know, we'll do what we do, but wouldn't it be better if we made good choices rather than bad choices? Well, wouldn't, wouldn't you want your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids to live in a world where you started to make choices towards health um, in the same way that you go to the doctor finally and, and start the process of healing rather than the process of hiding. Thanks. I think we still have a couple of people who haven't checked in for the first round. Um, and you're welcome to pass, but if anybody wants to complete the check-in, please do so now. Scott, dive on in. Uh, you can raise your hand so we can see you in the upper left, or you can just start talking. Scott, raise his hand. There we go. Sorry, I always lose the button. It's, I wish it was a way to have the, the raise hand button be visible all the time. Um, okay, so I bumped into a phrase Sunday. And I'm going to ask all of you if you know the source, because I went on a little rabbit hole. And you guys are very quick to throw sources in the chat. You're very well connected with the information of the world, I think. And so I'm wondering if you might know where this came from, because I went down a little rabbit hole and I couldn't, I couldn't find it. I found it in a couple old blog posts and in a weird book that was self-published. And anyway, the phrase is, reality is undefeated. And this hit me like a lightning bolt when I read it, because I thought, well, yeah, of course it is. You can, you can have a model in your brain of what it should be, what you think it is, what it ought to be, what we need to do, what we can do, what we should try, what we have to do, but reality is undefeated. It always wins is not it's an interesting model. It's an interesting phrasing, but the, the the idea behind it is that it just it just is. Products fail, relationships go sideways. You bump into things that you weren't expecting. You try something and it doesn't go quite like you thought. Well, of course, because it has to work given reality. And so, what's included in reality? Well, you have you know, obviously all the sciences, which are our best guess and constantly updated of what reality is. And it isn't that reality has to change, it's that the science has to change. Well, what about religions and different political angles? And all that's all part of reality because as a social organization, a social group, that's, it's all part of it. You can't take it out or say, this doesn't exist. Well, yes, it exists. It exists because it's we can talk about it. It's there. So reality, nature bats last. That's great. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to have to scroll back up in the chat because I wasn't looking. But um, it just seemed like a phrase. I thought, why have I not heard this before? Because it to some of the comments earlier about Klaus saying, why are we going towards the wall when we can see the wall? Or uh, Pete saying, we don't have to fix it. We could ignore it and let it do whatever it does. Maybe that's the wrong approach. Who knows? But reality will continue on no matter what we do. And it will judge. I'm going to use that word. It will judge what we do. It will. It will say, okay, well, what you tried was ineffective because your model was wrong. 
and you missed something. So anyway, I just thought it was a very significant little phrase. And I was really surprised I hadn't heard it before. So thank you for all this. I'm going to go scroll back up and see all these great comments. Hello. Um, I've been exposing myself to some uh, South American thinkers in the last month or so. Uh, it started with Gil uh, sending me an article on Sentapensir, which is thinking with feeling and feeling with thinking. And I've been reading Manfred Max Neef. And I'm really recognizing that my mind has been colonized. And um, it's very hard to get out of a colonized mind. It's really challenging. Um, these ideas pop up and it's like, wow, that's really radical. And it, it's actually um, radical in the true sense of going to the root of things. Um, a, a lot of the most creative thinking and rigorous thinking that I've seen is coming out of people who are refusing to succumb to the neoliberal economic paradigm and ordering of life and saying we need, you know, we share one planet with many different worlds. And um, there's a very focused, very powerful movement to create one world of we're going to organize the planet around neoliberal economics and we're just going to, you know, take whatever we need. <clears throat> going all the way back to Bacon, torture nature to get her secrets out of her and, you know, like a tough shit. And there's huge resistance in many, many countries to this. And, and um, so I really like Max Neef. Um, he makes this distinction that our, our economics uh, today have become, um, what does he say? Uh, they've created math, they've created models that are mathematically attractive, but completely divorced from reality. And, um, he actually got a PhD at Cal Berkeley and was teaching economics. And when Reagan came along, he said, oh, man, this trickle down stuff, this is not going to work. And the whole if you're going to keep the IMF and the World Bank in place, it's never going to work. So he went back to Chile. And he realized when he was in working in impoverished villages that nothing that he had learned in economics in the in the, the Western model was useful to people who were hungry and poor. And so he developed an entirely different way of approaching economics. And he makes this distinction between needs and satisfiers. And um, there are uh, nine basic needs that, um, that we all have, protection, affection, participation, whatnot. Um, and then there's four domains of each of those. There's being, doing, having, and interacting. And satisfiers change over time. So the way in which we get our needs satisfied changes from culture to culture and time to time. Um, and it's just, it's a really fantastic uh, look. It's very, very much deeper than anything I've seen. And it hurts my brain to look at it. It's like, wow, this is very, very, I read this guy and his, I call him really nutrient dense. It's like a truffle. I'll, I'll read a page. I have to set it aside and think about it and go back and reread it. Um, but it's just stretching my mind in, in some very interesting ways. And I can't, um, fully articulate it because I'm still just exposing myself for the first time trying to absorb this and digest it. Um, but I really, yeah, thanks. There's, um, I can put some links in. Wikipedia has a great page on uh, his needs and satisfiers. Um, so, and yes, and he was very involved in the natural step. So this is just what's going on in my head. And I, I'm, I don't know yet how to apply it, but I just find that it's so refreshing to have a very well thought out, very rigorous um, uh, background of a completely different economic paradigm than the one I was brought up inside of. And um, I, I've, I've, it's giving me a lot of hope. Um, I, uh, because my last name is Homer, I always have had to know something about mythology. And what I've discovered in myth, myths and stories is that whenever it looks like the bad guy's just about to grab the brass ring, you know, the hobbit, the least among us comes up and goes, no, not going to let that happen. And um, that is, that is the, the, the myth that keeps reinventing itself. You know, humans always bring ourselves to the brink and then somehow something happens. Now, 
not saying civilization will collapse, not saying things aren't going to, you know, be pretty dicey. If we all woke up tomorrow fully enlightened, there's enough inertia in the system to keep the suffering going for a long time. But um, I find personally, although it's very hard, because like similar to Jerry, I'm a, I'm a um, short-term pessimist, uh, a long-term optimist, and an intermediate term pessimist. I often find myself thinking about what's going to happen in 30 or 50 or 100 years, and, and it looks grim, and that comes and sits right in front of me and makes it hard to see what to do next. And I'm like, I have to push that back so that my general optimism can can be there, can you know come to the fore. Um, and it's a, it's a daily challenge. But story and the re-sacralizing of the world, of seeing the world as alive and related, I think is the only thing that's going to allow humanity the chance for long-term survival. Because if we keep treating it like it's inert, if we keep treating it like it's it has no life, if we destory it, if we drive the spirits out of it, then we don't relate to it as that which brought us forth. We see it as we got plopped down here on top of it instead of emerging from it. And um, so this is this is the the slow simmering transformation going on inside of me as I read all this stuff. And uh, pretty interesting. So I just recommend anybody who's interested, I can I can send you links. There's really good stuff out there to um, challenge your your thinking around how to organize societies on an economic paradigm that actually allows for the thriving of life. And this is what I'm not seeing in a lot of um, people who are saying we need new economics. Um, so I, I, it's just check out Max Steve and check out Sentipens here, and especially thinking and feeling Sentipen, Sentipen San con la tierra, thinking and feeling with the earth. Um, I think it's it's a pathway to uh, a much better participation in life. Thank you. I think most everybody's checked in. If not, raise your hand now, but uh, everybody feel free to jump in and discuss. Go ahead, Doug. Then Gene. I would like to follow up on Pete's comment, looking in a way, what's the analytic method that might help us go forward? So I've been in two conversations with groups. In the first, we're talking about who will do what and when will they do it? Uh, that turns out to stimulate a lot of imagination, but also a lot of conflict. So it's not a terrific method. The one that's more successful is working with the Institute for New Economic Thinking. We've been looking at plausible scenarios. And the question is to take a scenario and say, is this plausible? For example, uh, can the electric grid that we, the fossil fuel regime we have be replaced with an electric grid? Uh, there are good reasons that that scenario fails. The three scenarios we've been working with are first, uh, super tech, uh, technical acceleration everywhere, using the internet to manage uh, the world's resources and jobs uh, and all that. You, it's a kind of Silicon Valley wet dream uh, that we could use the technology to solve the problems. The second scenario is radical localization. As things break down, local groups form around the resources that they have. Obviously, some places can't do that, which is going to be too bad. But those that can uh, could try. That's the second scenario. The third scenario, which is kind of obvious, is that we aren't going to do anything of significance to deal with climate change. That's the scenario. So looking at them, are they plausible or not, has led to a really good discussion without acrimony and without the conflict. Somehow having three possibilities going simultaneously cuts down the conflict level of the discussion and gets people more imaginative. 
And part of the task is to break through uh, our conventional opinion to see that things are so bad that we have to have a freer kind of imagination to possibly cope with what's going on. And getting to imagination is the goal. Thank you, Doug. Um, this morning I read the Amanda Palmer post from Ted that just finished uh, that David Weinberger posted to the OGM list, which was fun and interesting. And Amanda Palmer is one of those humans I look at as a, a person who lives life absolutely out to the fullest, just the falling onto the crowd in the mosh pit sort of uh, thing that she does. And uh, she's really extraordinary in so many ways. And she says she's as part of this um, as part of this thing. She's talking about. Um, she quotes a lot of the the people that she hears uh, talk during TED, and these are all things that are going to be released in the next few weeks as new TED talks and so forth. And there was one that really stood out for me. It was about pain. There's apparently a speaker on pain who says, "What you feel is mostly what you expect to feel." And this sort of couples up with me with uh, suffering is optional, uh, another piece of wisdom, and a bunch of other observations that our perceptions and expectations truly shape our, ex our felt experience of anything. And that involves what is your frame of mind going into it, that involves how much fear and anxiety you do have about it, that involves are you catastrophizing or are you optimizing, are you looking up or are you looking down? Um, and I'm really interested in that aspect of how we handle change. And that takes me over to uh, plans are worthless, but planning is uh, is key or important. I'm forgetting the exact quote, and it's Eisenhower and a bunch of other people who said something like that. Um, but the idea that practice together, being resilient or creative or whatever else is really key. And Pete, I would love to see a plan for how this might roll out but but my feeling is that things are going to break in really unpredictable and strange ways and there's a marriage there somewhere in between of if we have tried a whole bunch of things and been creative really often in a lot of ways then when things break unpredictably we might be actually much better at coping with them and turning them into something golden and something better and i think none of us are prepared for things to break so badly that we're in a position where creativity flies out the window and I, I will say that um, I was part of a poverty simulation once uh, where they had turned the basement of an apartment building into a slum where you were hand, you were put into families and uh, handed some newspaper and some water with flour and asked to paste together bags out of the newspapers and try to sell the bags to merchants in order to make enough money for food and shelter. And it ran in little cycles and it was all sort of simulated. But at some point, like the merchant would come over, you'd try to be negotiating and they would grab your stack of bags you would just like work real fast to make and say, these are shitty bags, tear them up and throw them in the air. And I realized really quickly that the pressure of just trying to figure things out in the near term drives out most opportunities for thinking creatively, doing anything interesting. The luxuries we have just of time of facing our experiences go away real fast. Um, and also, I've known for a long time that people who live in very difficult situations, I, I could not survive in their situation for very long. They are really smart. They are working everything they know how to work. These are not dumb people. These are people trapped by circumstances um, whom we ought to be helping escape the circumstances. And I'm wondering several sort of topics far from where I started. But, but I feel like um, how we approach this, what we expect to happen and how we look at it is really massively important to the outcomes we will experience, even in that direct sense of what you, uh, uh, what you, what you get is what you, uh, uh, what you feel is mostly what you expect to feel. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Check-ins are difficult because so many things happen in two weeks. So yesterday I talked with Jack Park, a lovely friend um, who's going through some difficulties with his health, as am I. Um, and boy, did we connect. I love Jack Park. Um, Jerry, 
people who live in difficult situations. I'd like to talk about that. Because I've noticed something. And I'm going to make an observation from personal experience. And it's heavy and it's deep. So I'll try to be calm. But I'll say that this is not a criticism, but an inquiry. But I want to point an observation I've made. We talk about the food system. I posted um, above, and I'll try to post it again. Not sure if I can do that. Um, it was farm workers last week tonight with John Oliver talking about my people, the people who basically are from California or you know the 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 area, the bio region that we are in, Mexico, California, um, and how we have strawberries, which Mexican farm workers call the backbreaking fruit, how we have salad, how we have organic vegetables, and who pays for them, and how they're paid, and who's exploited. So we talk about the food system, but we don't talk about the people. Sorry about the emotion. I'm going to re-regulate now. Center. What am I inputting? I'm seeing people on a screen. What am I outputting? What is my reaction? Or do I have a executive system response? And I'm saying, I don't want to make Klaus wrong. Klaus is doing great work. But I am not hearing in my observation about my people. I'm hearing about Blacks. I'm hearing about Jews all the time. And I'm not hearing about Mexican farm workers about immigrants from this land, about Native Americans, who include Native Mexican Americans, you know, people, you know, the Indians that my heritage comes from. And I wonder about that. It's like, why did I forget about that for many, many years when my parents were immigrants and came legally to this country? My grandfather was a bracero on my mother's side. And he worked picking lemons for Sunkist. And he worked really hard and raised my parents to be better than him. And that was a lot of pressure. And they raised me to be better than them. That was too much pressure. Why? Why didn't they teach me Spanish? Because they didn't want me to be discriminated against because their knuckles were hit with a ruler by the nuns if they spoke Spanish in America. And why are we not seeing the humans in the food system? Why are we talking about planetary scale? Why are we talking about systemic scale, about business, about capitalism, when people, real people, are suffering? Thank you for listening. This is not a criticism. I love Klaus and what he does. It's an inquiry into what I haven't seen until now, until seeing John Oliver's um, uh, excellent presentation about the food system and, and the people in it. Why are we not seeing the people? Why did, let me put it in a me language. Why did I, with my mother's in my in my youth, in living in Santa Maria, going to Guadalupe, which is a beautiful town um, west of Santa Maria, and and you know the farm workers, Viva la Huelga, the strike, the grape the grape growers, you know the pickets against Safeway. This was part of my youth, and I didn't remember that until a day or two ago, three days ago, four, whenever I saw the um, John Oliver thing. I think it comes out on Sunday night. Um, something like that why hadn't i seen the real human cost of the food we eat that i eat that we all take for granted this is something that affects me deeply and again no not a criticism it's an observation and it sparks me with passion to inquire into my own blindness and maybe I can use that, my own blindness, the passionate story of that, to inspire you to look with imagination at maybe 
what we're all not seeing because we're just used to going to the store and getting some strawberries. But somebody's back has been in pain for years because that's the only way to feed their kids. I really appreciate you listening to this. And I hope the meaning comes through the information that I'm giving and that it leads to understanding, cooperation, coordination, and a different perspective. Perspective is worth 10 IQ points? No, it's worth 100 IQ points. I'm looking at the perspective like, oh my God, my people. Wow, how did I forget that? Thank you again for listening. Thank you, Mark, um, very much. Scott, then Klaus, and then we're getting close to the end of our call. I'm going to go back to something that, um, I don't know, several months ago, I said, you know, I love it when we ask questions of each other to clarify something that was said. Um, I've been waiting to ask this, and Doug just kind of opened the door with, with a way to do that. So Doug, your, your comment about plausible scenarios and using that as an analytic method, I think that's very interesting, um, especially in counter to the who will do what and how will they do it kind of model. So I'm wondering, you, you offered up three plausible scenarios. And the second one was radical localization, which is something you've been talking about for quite a while, about we have to live where the food is, or we have to grow our food where where we live, one or, one or the other. And I'm wondering if you could just talk for a minute about parts of the plausible scenario of radical localization that happened during your conversations. Wow. Um, Is that possible to summarize? I don't know. Or maybe not. No, it's, uh, uh, there are threads that emerge. Uh, for example, with radical localization, the problem is that successful groups will be the target of unsuccessful groups. Uh, that's part of the difficulty with that scenario. Uh, somebody mentioned the guns. There are too many guns around, and they're going to get used. Uh, the likely thought is that in, I mean, if you start with the localization scenario as people in face-to-face -face relationships in kind of primitive democracy, what could spoil that? from happening. And certainly that people bring their character to any possible solution. So the, one of the things that will happen quickly is people trying to reassert property rights over the stuff in their local community. They will bring to the discussion the model that people owning things is the only possible uh, future. So that has to be overcome by the necessity of cooperating together. Uh, there's so many aspects to this. Uh, it, with radical localization, you run into the problem of, uh, for example, tools. You use hose to work the land. Uh, what do you do when the hose break that break down? How do we manufacture new ones? If your blue jeans wear out, where do new ones come from? We don't have the local technologies to do those replacements, so it's very difficult to look at. Uh, a radical localization scenario that's not amplified by other possibilities. We certainly have the feeling that, in fact, all three scenarios could happen at the same time. That's the most plausible. But for analytic purposes, it's worthwhile taking each one and poking it. You know, is this plausible? Could this possibly happen? And if the reasons why it can't, let's find them. Uh, in part because it's ridiculous to put energy into potential solutions that are uh, we already know enough to know are not going to work. Uh, replacing the fossil fuel world with an electric grid world is not possible. The amount of materials and the cost of those materials uh, is uh, thwarts the project. Anyway, I'm not answering your question directly, except to say that there are many threads that come up. And part of what's been great about that is 
everybody in the group, we've got uh, eight people who were doing this, uh, agree on the conclusions that are emerging about what's what. There's the, the agreement in the group is very high and that we don't rehash old material. People have the integrity to remember the parts of the conversation we've already had. So it's working extremely well and sort of off the record, the effort now is how do we take this into the whole INET structure? Doug, that was perfect. Thank you very much. Um, that gave me everything I was hoping. The, uh, the richness of that conversation was encapsulated very well. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to respond to Mark. Um, so, and, and also linking in with Doug was just saying, I, I don't see anything radical about localization, right? The, this, the food system needs to be decentralized, uh, not radicalized. Um, and so how do you go about this? And, how, and, and actually the opportunity to make change is, in a market segment that is unattractive and neglected by the general industry. So people of low income, um, people, you, you're talking about food deserts, for example. There are some you know, 30, 40 million Americans living in food deserts have no access to a store within, within reach that's, that offers fresh food because simply it's not profitable for uh, the, the big retailers to operate in there. It's too dangerous. Uh, it's it's uh, they don't have the purchasing power and so on. So the opportunity really is to engage with the sector of the of the economy that is struggling. So so small farmers, entry level farmers, independent farmers, right? Then when you get into this and you try to to um, understand the market forces that govern them, you realize that they are stuck in a regulatory frame that prevents them from accessing markets. So for example, you know, they can't sell meat because you, know, you have to jump through all kinds of hoops to get USDA certification. Um, and, but yet meat is, is the, the most profitable part of selling food. You, know, you just make a whole lot more money selling uh, a chicken than selling a carrot. So the, 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 when, when, and this is what I'm really trying to get into right now, even in my own community here and in Oregon, you know, to, to help people understand and see that we are really handicapping uh, and, and, and sort of, um, sort of uh, casting in poverty you now by not allowing people to feed themselves, to grow their own food you know, and, and to process their own food, make, preserve it, can it, pickle it, you know, and, and be able to sell it. So, you know, as you know, I mean, I worked uh, for a food wholesaler in, 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 and I, I had teams in 30 countries uh, who were I mean, teams of analysts because we were doing like market segmentation strategies and stuff like that market research. Every country in the world, you go to the poorest country, go to Vietnam, China, you know, India, there is no problem accessing food because everybody has some roadside stand, you know, and, and they can sell their food. And we have sterilized the food system here in the US where you can't do that, right? So making these changes, first of all, touches our own empathy, right? Because we want to help. But then it also it also stabilizes this segment of the population because you know food bottom of the pyramid right and so it's food and shelter so so by by opening up by by a, a, uh, educating and informing the legislative process people of of uh, of good intentions um we can we can we can soften change you know into the process it doesn't have to be conflict you know and and that's uh and, and and so once you have this vision you know where 
food is is first of all yeah environmental damage you know water and so on but also personal health the rockefeller foundation did a study some four years ago where they, the outcome was we we're spending roughly one trillion dollars on subsidized underpriced food then we're spending one trillion dollars to repair the environmental damage it caused by raising it then we're spending one trillion dollars on fixing the healthcare impact of serving a nutritionally deficient diet right so so the the the, the there is there is so much we can do to stabilize society to 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 secure the base right because when people become desperate because food gets too expensive or unavailable and so on i mean that is a sure recipe for 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 problems so mark there, there is total emphasis you now on on dealing with people who are in this in this frame and in this in this work but it may not come through when we talk about this in systems thinking and you know and in uh, project management and so on yeah. Thank you, Klaus. I have a feeling that Ken Homer is late for his uh, 930 call, but is waiting because he has a poem for us, perhaps. This is just me thinking. Uh, Mark, if you will allow Ken to read the poem and depart, uh, I will pass the floor to you. You're psychic, Jerry. This has been a tough one. I've been going back and forth listening to this call finger. What, a, what poem's going to fit here? So I think I have one. Um, this is called Gravity's Law by Rilke. How surely gravity's law, strong as an ocean current, takes hold of the smallest thing and pulls it to the heart of the world. Each thing, each stone, blossom, child, is held in place. Only we, in our arrogance, push out beyond what we each belong to for some empty freedom. If we surrendered to the Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like trees. I got to read that again. If we surrendered to the Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like trees. Instead, we entangle ourselves in knots of our own making and struggle lonely and confused. So, like children, we begin again to learn the things, learn from the things because they are in God's heart. They have never left Him. This is what things can teach us to fall patiently to trust our heaviness. Even a bird has to do that before he can fly. See you all next week. Thank you, Ken. Homer B. Um, Mr. Carranza. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, where did Car um, House go? A bunch of people just dropped off the call because they had to bounce. Oh, dear. Um, again, I'm going to try to make an observation and not a criticism, but an inquiry to Klaus. We're still recording. Um, have you picked lettuce? Have you, you know, done organic farming with your hands as opposed to look at the systems? That's kind of my point. You got to do both and you got to be, be, you know, touch the soil. Um, and maybe Klaus has, I don't know. I don't hear him saying that. I don't hear him saying I've walked a mile in a farm worker's shoes rather than I've walked a mile at the level of where I can make a lot of money, which is as a consultant. It's not a criticism. I, I don't want to make Klaus wrong. And I've, I feel it's really difficult to deal with the emotions of care. And I just want to leave with this. You know, again, I was told a very healing thing about uh, the problems I'm going through. Mark, my cousin's head, cousin's wife. We love twice as strong. And then we, when we lose, we hurt twice as strong but that's who we are and i wouldn't change that I wouldn't change that for the world thank you for loving it. thank you for listening thank you mark 
I think a nice way to end this call would just be to sit with what you just said and uh, everybody drop off as you as you wish. Carl, good luck with your dad's place and everything. I wish you, I hope everything goes very smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like all the pieces are on the table now, just uh, connecting good. the last few. Sounds like some progress. Yeah, hopefully. Be well. Okay, thanks. You too. Thanks.